in the seventies when I first started looking for these, we'd spend a week in Pozo de Antas, and if we were lucky, we'd see them once. They were incredibly difficult to find. But this is one of the great success stories of conservation because in 1970, the animal was really headed towards extinction, and a couple of people were really key in this. Adelmar Quimbrofilio, who's the Brazilian pioneer of Brazilian primatology, had started to do survey work on them. And a couple of people from American zoos came down, John Perry from the National Zoo and Clyde Hill from the San Diego Zoo, and they wrote a few articles that said, this animal is going extinct, we got to do something. So in 1972, we convened a group in the National Zoo in Washington, brought the Brazilian experts up, brought everybody from the international community who knew anything about them, and started to uh, talk about what needed to be done. There were about 70 in captivity. Nobody really knew how many there were in the wild. The animal occurs only in this lowland area, very limited lowland area of the state of Rio de Janeiro. Mm. And they said, um, okay, let's figure out how to do the husbandry. Deborah Kleiman from the National Zoo took on that task. Very quickly figured out how to keep them in captivity to the point that within a decade you were up over 500 animals, so many that you didn't know where to put them. And the efforts by Coimbra, the Brazilian government, we worked, I was then at World Wildlife Fund, we worked closely with, with the Brazilian government and with the Brazilian experts, got the uh, Poça das Antas Biological Reserve created here in 1974. That's the big one here, about 5,000 hectares. And in 1983, the captive breeding had become so successful that there were excess animals in captivity. In 1983, Dever Climans, Coimbra, Jim Dietz, also working then with the National Zoo, came down and started a reintroduction project, putting these animals back into the wild and starting little by little to put them into, into um, private lands like you see here. And this is phenomenal because here you have uh, private properties with having the animal on the land is actually a, a, a very, uh, uh, very big status symbol for people now mm -hmm. in, this, uh, in this region. And the reintroduction effort because <clears throat> European and American zoos were sending the animals back to Brazil. It was very interesting because the Brazilians thought, wow, this is incredible. That this animal is so important and it really elevated the prestige of the animal within Brazil. And so that really led to all of the efforts that you see today. The animal is now so popular, it's on the <laughs> 20 real note. Um, really quite amazing. And, and one of the things that was really impressive was these management committees that were created. You had the Brazilian government representatives, Brazilian civil society experts, and a whole range of foreign experts all coming together to create management committees. And everyone said, uh, we've got to get all of the animals, including the ones that have been out in foreign zoos and private hands for sometimes for decades, all of them have to be the property of Brazil. Mm. So everybody who had them had to sign an agreement saying that these animals were uh, the property of Brazil. And if the Brazilians wanted them at any time, they could, they could call them back. They never have. They probably never will because they now have plenty of them. But these animals are all the property of Brazil. And that extended to the other two species of, uh, of lion tamarins, the black uh, lion tamarin from Sao Paulo and the uh, uh, golden-headed lion tamarind from the southern part of Bahia, and the new one that was described in 1990 from Paraná, the uh, Leontopithecus caissada. So now you have four of these these species. So it really became a model for international collaboration. The European and American zoos they liked the collaborative efforts, so they helped to fund it. The Brazilian government invested a lot in it, so it's really become. I think a model for how to deal with recovery of an endangered species. Mm. So now we've got what? How many in the wild? 1,600 in the wild? 1,600. And in captivity? I don't even know. It's probably well over 1,000. There's something like 160 mm -hmm. zoos that have them yeah. in captivity now. So really, some of the people that really need to be congratulated, Adam Marco and Brafilia, who started this in the 60s when nobody was looking at, at these animals. And he also, not only did he start the first study of the golden, he rediscovered the black and the golden-headed lion tamarind, animals that hadn't been seen since the early 1900s. So he rediscovered them in Sao Paulo and in, uh, in uh, Bahia. Deborah Kleiman, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, was a key person in captivity and in the, in the uh, reintroduction efforts. And then Denise and now Luis Paulo running this, this uh, wonderful association in Nicolaon Dorado here, which I think I think it's one of the best-run programs anywhere in the tropical world. She just 
she got a prize last year from uh, in uh, Nagoya in the biodiversity yes, yes. convention. She got a prize for some of the work that uh, that she had done here. So, um, and this has been replicated in Bahia with the golden-headed lion tamarind, replicated with the black lion tamarind in Sao Paulo, also with this uh, species that was discovered in 1990. So. I think everybody who deals with endangered species should come here and learn how this job was done and, and uh, I think it's been terrific.